We are going to go back to the gospel of Luke chapter 2. Only this time we're going up instead of down. We're going to the 4th through the 15th verse. And we'll also include the 20th verse as we consider the word of God before us. Luke 2, 4 through 15 and 20. When you have it, say amen. Now you can't not find the scriptures now. They're in your telephone. Before, you know, you could get lost and end up in Revelations. But now if you can type, you can find Luke 2 and 4. When you have it, say amen. <clears throat> and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came up upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, certainly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Can you say amen? One more verse, and the shepherds return glorifying, and the shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Back me up to that verse where it first mentions the shepherds. Yeah, go back, go back, go back. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. I want to talk this morning from the subject, shepherds in the field. Say that with me, shepherds in the field. Say it again, shepherds in the field. Don't minimize it or trivialize it or mention it as if it were just an, an incidental irrelevant to the magnitude of the story, though it appears to be so. Let's say it as if it were important. Shepherds in the field. Good, good, good. Father, bless the word. Sanctify it in our hearts. Let it resound in such a way that it outlasts this moment. Let it reverberate across the waters and around the world. Let it reach into the hospitals and the nursing homes and the airports and the bus stations and wherever people are beholding this message. Let it bring forth flesh now seed to the sower and bread to the eater 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Someone who loves him, say amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. My wife and I jokingly teased each other because I think she's Mrs. Santa Claus. And she calls me Scrooge. And it's not really that I don't enjoy Christmas. It's just that I don't enjoy putting up anything that I got to take back down again. Okay. If you're going to put up lights, leave them up. <laughs> Let it blink all year long. <laughs> she said, okay, okay. And I'm just introducing my message. Calm down, calm down. What I am excited about, though, is more than the commercialization of a particular day that we set aside to acknowledge Christ. I am excited what Christmas really means. To think that, that something as holy as God would make legal entry into the world respecting his own presidents and come in born of a virgin. That eternity would touch time. That the celestial would touch the terrestrial that the holy would become human, that the word would become incarnate in flesh is absolutely staggering. It is amazing to me from a theological perspective to understand that God has once again stooped down as he did in the creation when he made man from the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. When God came in Jesus, he was stooping again. He was reaching low that we might be made high. He came down so that we could come up. He took on our sins so that we could take on his righteousness. No wonder all of heaven started singing. It was an amazing, amazing, amazing moment. There was no precedence for this moment. That's the first thing I want you to see. There was no precedence for this moment, not only from eternal, eternity's perspective, from a human perspective, because I'm not sure that Mary and Joseph fully grasped the magnitude that this was a once in a lifetime appearance. This is not an encore. This is not a trivial incident. This is not like parting the Red Sea. This is not like turning water into wine. This is a once in a lifetime experience of which there's consequences and ramifications that have lasted 2,000 years. Everything before it looked to it and everything after it talks about it. This was the moment where the answer came to the question where the solution came to the problem. This was the moment that eternity and time clapped their hands together. And the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world in the book of Genesis is now foundation in time, is now slain in time. And time and eternity have finally come together. When the Bible first says that the lamb was slain from the foundations of the world, it was talking about Jesus all the way then. And yet we did not see him born or even on the cross yet because eternity is not restricted to time. It doesn't have to wait for time to come in order to manifest. Eternity is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Time was created by God in the creation. God existed before the first day was made. So eternity is bigger than time. Time is just a microcosm. Time is just a microcosm of eternity. Somebody say amen. And from, from, from a lofty perspective of a theological understanding of the magnitude of this moment, this is cataclysmic. Anytime heaven starts shouting, it's cataclysmic. Anytime the angels start rejoicing, we ought to be the first ones to give God praise and honor and glory. Anytime the angels start praising God, we ought to outdo them praising God because he came to redeem us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're shouting over something that they couldn't benefit from. We benefit from something that we won't shout about. That's why the Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, because he came for you. When you were in the pit, he came for you. When you were in trouble, he came for you. And yet, as powerful as this moment was, 
it has problems. You must understand that the fact that you have been empowered does not exempt you from problems. When we look at it from a divine perspective, we see the very power of God, the strategy of God, the strength of God, the inexhaustibility of his wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God, the ancient of days, the sovereign God, the mighty God. But from a human perspective, this night has a lot of problems. From heaven's standpoint, it was shouting time. But from Mary's standpoint, it was not a shouting time. Number one, there was no precedence for it. Anytime God does something for you for which you have no point of reference, it's frightening. It's fearful. It's uncertain. When you can't look back in your life and point to something that is similar and all of a sudden you find yourself in uncharted waters, it's uncomfortable. Not to mention the fact it was unorthodox. So you could not lean on the Hebrew Bible to get precedence for this kind of birth that she had. Can you imagine going to your rabbi and saying, you know, God got me pregnant the other night? <laughs> yeah. I've had a few come to this church and say that. I had the same reaction you just did. So there you are with this, without the benefit of sociological support, theological foundation, previous experience, you are out there on your own and want to talk to somebody that God is saying something to you that you have no precedence for, you have no background for, you have no support for, you've never seen him do anything like that in your life before, but he said something to you and you believe it. There was no precedence for it. There was, number two, there was no place for it. God had given her a word and a promise, but not a place. What do you do when God has given you a word and a promise and you have no place for it? What do you do when you know God spoke to you? You know he appeared to you. You know the Holy Ghost came upon you and left you with child. And the God who was thoughtful enough to come upon you and leave you with child didn't think of a place for you to stay. Amazed are the many people in this room and in this world who are online right now that you've been anointed for something that there's no place for. You got a message and there's no place to preach it. You got a song and there's no place to sing it. You got a vision, but you don't have a building to do it in. You got a business in you, but you don't have a company yet. You've got a book in you, but you don't have a publisher. Sometimes God will give you something that you have no place for. Am I talking to anybody today? Number three, there was no presence of angels. The angels were making a whole lot of noise when they announced to her, Hail Mary, you've been highly favored. You shall bring forth a son and his name shall be called Jesus. But by the time she was heavy with child, riding on a donkey, I would presume, in the hot Palestinian heat to give birth to a child without a physician, there were no angels saying, we got your back. Don't worry, girl. Everything's going to be all right. Sometimes God gets quiet. <laughs> when you're in his will and in his purpose, and he still says nothing at all. Sometimes you have to walk by faith and not by sight and not have the affirmation or the reaffirmation that the God who said it is still with you and you got to keep on walking anyway. Sometimes heaven gets quiet while you get nervous. Heaven gets uncomfortable. Heaven gets uncomfortable to the degree that it does not come to make you comfortable. It intends for you to have discomfort. She was in the wheel, but she was uncomfortable. 
Why do you know that the Bible didn't say that? No, but common sense says that if you're about to have a baby and you're riding on a donkey, <laughs> come on sisters, back me up. If you've ever been pregnant, would you like to take a ride into Bethlehem on a donkey? Yeah, saddle, strap, strap leg on a donkey, traveling down the road, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you are completely uncomfortable. I want you to understand in this age and era where our comfort has become so important that there are times in life that God doesn't care that you're not comfortable. <gasps> Oh, God, no, no, God cares, yeah. He cares about his purpose. He cares about his will. He cares about his destiny. But God doesn't always care about your comfort. Being in the will of God will make you uncomfortable. If you don't believe it, ask Jesus about the cross. So there was no presence for it. There was no place for it. There was no presence of angels in number four. There was no plan for it. She didn't know that she was going to give birth to that baby in Bethlehem. The region that she came into, she is not going there to have a baby. They are going from Jerusalem, Bethsaida, to, to, to Bethlehem to birth, to, to pay taxes. It was a quick trip that was necessary to pay homage or to pay taxes because Joseph was from the city of David. She did not get on that beast saying, I'm going to have this baby. She comes into the region and appears that the birth of Jesus wasn't planned to occur in Bethlehem by Joseph. He went there simply to handle some business. King James Version says it was to pay taxes. NIV says it was, it, was, it was the word used for tax could be interpreted to register. So whether they're registering their marriage or they're registering because they're from town, there was some sort of decree that required an immediate trip and they were traveling pregnant. I want to talk to some people that are traveling pregnant. You're traveling pregnant. You're traveling with something inside of you that hadn't come out yet. You're traveling with discomfort. You're traveling with dis-ease. You're moving forward, but there's something down inside of you that's weighting you down. They were traveling pregnant. Everybody had to go pay taxes, but they were traveling pregnant. The difference that set them apart from other people is that they were traveling pregnant and they had no plan that this would be the trip that took them over the edge. They had no plan that this would be the trip where her water broke. They had no plan that this would be the trip where she became so heavy with child that she went into labor and gave birth to a child in Bethlehem. They had no plan for it. They had no idea that this was the moment. This, incidentally, Bethlehem in the New Testament is often referred as Ephrata in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, when it's referred to as Ephrata, Rachel died giving birth on the way to Ephrata. This is not a nice, easy trip. Rachel went into labor and had Benoni, son of my sorrows, and died just outside Bethlehem. Maybe God kept her outside of Bethlehem so that she wouldn't fool around and think that she was having the Messiah and said, I got to stop you before you get in. But she died a little, shut up. She died a little ways outside of Ephrata. Uh, almost there. And God said, this is not the one that I want to be born in Bethlehem. 
No, 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 no. There is one coming that's going to be born in Bethlehem that will be king of kings. You're pregnant with a king, but I'm going to produce a king of kings and a lord of lords, and he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So whatever you're going to have, you're going to have to have it on your way. <laughs> on your way. But what they are like is neither one of them expected for their water to break and for them to be dilate nine centimeters and give birth on the road. What do you do when what you're carrying breaks forth before you're ready? How? What do you do when what you thought would happen in 2022 happens in 2021? What do you do when you lose control of the promise and it happens when it happens and you got to adjust to what you've got to adjust to? What do you do? What do you do when God has a plan but you don't? You know, God did not promise to let you in on his plan. He allows you to walk in the dark. God knew she was going to have that baby in Bethlehem. It was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. God knew she was going to go into labor, but Mary didn't know. Joseph didn't know. He had no plan. He had no place to stay. He had no presence of angels. Joseph didn't know what to do because the thing broke loose quicker than he thought. I want to take a minute and talk to somebody. What God has been talking to you about is going to break loose quicker than you think. What God has been speaking to you about over the last three months is going to break loose sooner than you think. What God has put in your spirit, you think it's going to break loose at the end of 22. God said it's going to break loose sooner than you think. Oh, if I was preaching years ago, I'd holler, get ready, 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 get ready. Your time schedule is not God's timetable. Her water broke on a donkey. What an inconvenient place to go into labor. What a filthy place. Who wants to have a sanctified baby in a desecrated place? And the heat is on for Joseph to make an emergency decision. An emergency decision. Because it appears that Mary is going to have her baby in the same place that Ruth had Obed. And Joseph is a descendant of King David. And Obed is David's great great grandfather. And it seems like it's happening again. Only it is not Ruth this time, it's Mary. And she's pregnant. I had a plan to pay taxes, not nurse babies. But it happens when it happens. <laughs> what I just said right there is worth the whole sermon. It happens when it happens. It happens when it happens. Ready or not, it happens when it happens. It happens when it happens. You got to get ready because it happens when it happens. You got to stop living in the moment and get ready for the unexpected because it happens when it happens. You got to stop spinning up to the limit and get some reserve because what God's going to do is going to happen when it happens. And when it happens, you got to be ready for it. It happens when it happens. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody. Write this down. 
around. It happens when it happens. You can't live like you ain't pregnant. You can't live like you're not expecting something. When you expecting something, you got to have enough stuff in your bag to get you through in a pinch because it happens when it happens. It happened. And all of a sudden, in the night, in the night, in the night preaching this now, you don't get it because we live with electricity. Jesus never saw a light bulb. He never saw a lamp. He never saw a light bulb or a lamp in the traditional sense that we do. There were no street lights. It happens in the dark. In the dark. God brings the light of the world into the world in the dark. <laughs> he displays him like a diamond on black velvet against the blackest of nights. God brings in the light of the world. And in the darkness of night, with every door he's knocked on closed. Oh, I wish I had time. If I had time, I'd talk to some frustrated men. Everything you knock on is not working. Everything you tried is not working. Every time you knock on the door, they shut the door in your face. And it's a crisis and it's an emergency. And you're worried about your family and you're worried about yourself. And I want you to know you're not alone. The Bible does not hide the frustration of a man who's trying to find an open door. And door after door after door after door is shut in his face. And amidst the darkness of night, the baby says, I won't wait any longer. And all he sees is a barn over yonder across the field. And in the night, he makes his way to the barn. Now, I'm, to, I'm ready for my text. I'm ready for my text. The Bible says that as they are traveling through the night across the field toward the barn, Luke takes the time. Luke is one of the most amazing writers of the gospel because he is the most educated of the writers of the gospel. He goes into detail that other writers do not go into. Luke takes the time to notice that there were shepherds in the field. And it's such an odd thing. He doesn't tell us the color of the barn or how many horses are in the barn, what are the animals are, that are in the barn. He doesn't tell us how, my, how many miles or kilometers we are away from the barn. He doesn't even tell us the kind of field that we're in. He just mentions that there were shepherds in the field and this this is what draws me to the text it, i know it should be jesus but it's not really jesus that draws me to the text because i have been preaching 43 years and i have preached my share of jesus messages at christmas time what really has me stirred it's the brief notation, almost as if it were an afterthought, that there were shepherds in the field. Considering that the Bible said that if all that Jesus had done had been written, the world could not contain the books, we have to take seriously when Luke takes the time to tell us what appears to be an insignificant piece. An insignificant piece of information he, he appears to mention as a footnote, as a descriptive analysis. And there were shepherds in the roof, in the field. Why are the shepherds in the field and not the pasture? Why are the shepherds in the field and not the pasture? Why are the shepherds 
in the field and not in a sheepfold. It would appear that at night, as I understand it, most shepherds gather their sheep into the sheepfold and protect them in the sheepfold. Why are the shepherds letting the sheep graze at night in the field? Shepherds don't normally graze. Sheep don't normally graze in the field. They graze in the pasture. When you hear the word field, that's vegetation, that's growth, that's harvest, that's gardening, that's crops. Why are the sheep, and most importantly, the shepherd, in the field? I, I'm, I'm scratching my head about it because, because I don't understand why the shepherds are abiding in the field and that they're not in the pasture and that they're not in the sheepfold. And why does Luke allude to shepherds in the field? And I look at it and I think to myself, wait a minute. The shepherds are in the field. And I have seen this before. I have seen this phrase about the shepherds in the field before. Do you remember over in Genesis when the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that Abel is a tender of the sheep, which makes him a shepherd, and Cain is a tiller of the soil. Do you remember that text? And that Abel offered up a sacrifice unto God, and God received it, and Cain did not offer up a sacrifice toward God that was acceptable because Cain offered up to God something from the field. Cain offered up to God a sacrifice from the field and Abel offered up a sacrifice from the pasture. Abel offered up a blood sacrifice and Cain offered up something from the field. And do you remember how Cain was wroth? He was angry with Abel because unto Abel God had respect on his sacrifice. Can I get into this just for a minute? I, I just want to talk to the Bible lovers just for a minute. I'm confused here because this shepherd's in the field. I've seen it before because when God tells Cain, if thou doest not well, will I not receive you? And Cain walks away mad and he's angry. The Bible says that when Abel came into the field, Cain slew him. And I asked myself, is not Abel coming into the field? Shepherds in the field. Is not this a mirrored reflection? of what happened between Cain and Abel and between the birth of Jesus that the shepherd is in the field? Isn't that how Abel got killed? If Abel had stayed in the pasture, he would have never gotten killed. It was because Abel came over on Cain's territory that he was attacked and murdered and destroyed. And it was there with the shepherd in the field. The Cain who wouldn't kill a lamb kills a man because the man is a shepherd. A shatter. Y'all don't hear me this morning. The man is a shepherd in the field. Now I understand why Luke mentions to me the shepherd in the field. 
Because in order for a shepherd to be in the field, he has to be willing to come out of his territory. And suddenly I recognize that the shepherds in the field are important because the angels that appeared and spoke in the text that I read at the beginning in Luke chapter two are not talking to Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph are the ones who need a visitation from the angels, but the Bible said that the angels came to talk to the shepherds. Why do the angels even care to talk to the shepherds? Who are these shepherds? Why do they deserve a revelation? Mary is the one whose legs are in a stirrup. Mary is the one who's in labor. Mary is the one who has to wrap her baby in milk rags. What you call sackcloths are milk rags where they've been milking the cow. And she now wraps the milk of the word in milk rags. And if anybody needs a word from the angels, it ought to be, it ought to be Mary. But instead, the angels don't even go and talk to Mary. The angels run to the shepherds in the field. And they tell the shepherds in the field, leave your sheep and go to the barn in Bethlehem because your sheep are just a shadow. Your sheep are just a shadow. What's happening in the barn is the reality. Your sheep represent what Jesus is. And he tells the shepherd, the sheep will be fine. Go look in that bar. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Behold, you're watching the wrong sheep. You're watching the wrong sheep. None of the blood from none of those sheep will resolve the sin issue and set the captive free and loose the bound. But there is a lamb who just hit the world whose blood will redeem the world from the curse of the law and from sin and death. There is a lamb. There is a lamb that you ought to have your eyes on. Oh! Father, fix my eyes on Jesus. Can I go a little bit deeper? And then I began to recognize that Jesus is reenacting what Abel did. Abel came into Cain's field and Jesus coming to earth <laughs> is him coming into Satan's field. For Satan has been given dominion over the earth realm and God has cast him out of heaven. And Jesus says, not only will I run you out of heaven, I will come on your own territory and I will overthrow you in your own territory because I'm going to break the curse that was on man. You killed Abel, but you will not destroy me. I'm coming where you are. And here he comes down through 40 and two generations stepping down the corridors of time. Here comes Jesus down where they are. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Type it, everybody. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Tell America, here comes Jesus. Tell this crazy world, here comes Jesus. Tell the people on ventilators, here comes Jesus. Tell the people in grief, here comes Jesus. Tell the people in depression, here comes Jesus. Tell the people upset, here comes Jesus. Tell the people disturbed, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Get ready for him. Here he comes. Oh, the 
that's God's word to somebody. I don't know who it is, but that's God's word to you. Here comes Jesus. You're tired, you're frustrated, you've been uncomfortable, you've been at your wit's end, you can't get a word from God. Here is your word from God. Here comes Jesus. 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 Tell your bills. Here comes Jesus. Tell your depression. Here comes Jesus. Tell your fear. Here comes. Oh, I wish I had the old church. I feel the Holy Ghost praise. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I feel the spirit of the living God. Look at somebody to holler. Here comes Jesus. 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 Here comes. Jesus, get your pocketbook and holler in your pocketbook. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Anoint your children's head with awe and say, Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes. Jesus! And I hear you when you say, well, if Jesus came to reverse what happened to Abel, then preacher, he failed because Abel got killed and Jesus got crucified. And I say to you, keep reading. <laughs> because when Jesus rose from the dead, he made an open display of principalities and powers and broke the curse. Let me hasten to my point. The shepherds in the field are mentioned because the true shepherd the true shepherd the good shepherd is in the field and the angels needed to announce to these shepherds that the good shepherd that's how, is now in the field. That's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about the shepherd is in the field. The shepherd is in the field. He couldn't redeem me from heaven. He couldn't redeem me surrounded by the royal diadem. He couldn't redeem me sitting on the throne before the crystal glass. He couldn't redeem me surrounded by Michael and Gabriel, but the Shabbat willing to redeem me. He came where I was and he stepped down into humanity and the angels wanted the word to get out that the shepherd uh, is in the field. Uh, tell every wolf, tell every witch, tell every hex, uh, tell every spell, uh, tell every disease, uh, tell every affliction, the shepherd uh, is in the field. The shepherd is here. Somebody say the shepherd is here. What does that mean? I'll let David answer you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. 
He restoreth my soul. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life will be changed because the shepherd is in the field and the Lord is my shepherd. Tell the devil, if you won't pay me, God will. If you won't feed me, God will. If you won't make a way, God will. If you ain't got my back, God's got my back. Because the shepherd, the shepherd is in the field. 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 The rod and the staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemy. Yeah. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow, it was nighttime, the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou art with me, the shepherd. Oh, the good shepherd, the good shepherd. The shepherd is in the field. Tell COVID-19. <laughs> Tell him, the shepherd is in the field. Tell depression, tell suicide, tell discomfort, tell disgrace, tell shame, tell heaviness. The shepherd is in the field. No wonder the shepherds left their sheep. The shadow always recedes in the presence of the reality. No wonder Luke mentions that it was while shepherds were in the field, while the shadow was holding the place, the real thing came. And there was no better place for Mary to have Jesus than to have him in the field. Because he is my shepherd. I have everything I need because he is my shepherd. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. I want everybody who's been worried about anything, who's been up at night, who's been uncomfortable, who's been wrestling with dis-ease, to lift your hands and open your mouth and worship because the shepherd is in the field. I don't care whether you feel silly or not. Lift your hands and open your mouth and worship him because the shepherd. He's in the field. He just hit the field. Every other door was closed. The shepherd is... I can't hear you. The shepherd is... Whatever you've been worried about, whatever you've been upset about, whatever's been on your heart and been on your mind. Whatever's had you up at night, take comfort. Take courage. Lift your voice like a trumpet. The shepherd. <laughs> Devil! Hey, devil! 
Bethlehem, the shepherd. The shepherd is in the field. This Sunday morning, we are going to cast all our cares on him. We're going to put full responsibility on him. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to, I want you to write down, text in, send in the message, everything that you've been carrying that you need to cast on the shepherd. I want you to turn it, we're going to release it to him and then I'm going to pray for everything that you wrote. And I want you to give me something to pray for so that you don't have to carry this alone. As the under shepherd, I'm going to bring you to the chief shepherd and let your requests be made known unto him. Write it right now. I need you, I need you, I need you to take care of this, Lord. I need you to fix this. I need you to fix this. Write it right now. And as you write it, we're going to sing. We're going to worship. And we're going to cast it all on the shepherd. Name it. Declare it. I asked him to sing a song right here. Where is it? Declare it. I'm praying for you.
you believe God knows what you need go ahead and put your hands up and begin to praise the name of Jesus all over the building wherever you are if you believe that what you wrote down shall come to pass if you believe that God is a providing God if you believe that he is a delivering God if you believe that he's a chain breaking God lift up the name of Jesus here Jesus comes here Jesus comes here Jesus comes great and mighty God we reference you we call upon you you're mighty you're worthy you're omnipotent you're omniscient we praise you God we give you glory you're a mighty God. You give us blessings. We don't have room to receive. You give us power. We don't have room to receive. You give us purpose. We don't have room to receive. Great God that you are, we ask you now, cleanse our heart, cleanse our mind, cleanse our purpose, cleanse our authority, Cleanse how we walk, cleanse how we talk. Move, mighty God. Move in our innermost parts. Move, God. Move. Move till you can't move anymore. Move until diseases run away. Move until demons flee. Move until curses are broken. Move, God, until blessings are unlocked. Great God, great God, we ask for your blood we plead it over everything we've asked for over everything we've laid at your feet we plead the blood the blood of the shepherd the blood of the lamb the blood we plead it over our finances over our marriages over our children over our home over our churches over our platforms the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for why you are. And we thank you, God, for we lift up our heads for which cometh our help. Our help cometh from you. Our help, it cometh from you. Not our friends, not our family. Our help. It comes from you. We thank you for you always provide. All we have needed, your hands have provided. All that we have needed, your hands have provided. And we thank you for being that kind of God. For being the kind of God that fills us when we're empty. We surrender all to you, God. Teach us what that looks like. We give ourselves to you, God. Teach us what that looks like. We surrender our platforms and our authority to you, God. Teach us what that looks like. Teach us how to serve you better. Teach us how to give you better. Teach us how to serve you, Lord. In humility, God, we surrender our will for your way. We plead, God, for you to show us the way. Yeah, yeah, give us strategy yeah, yeah. give us structure yeah, 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 yeah. unlock promises yeah, yeah, that we yeah, may yeah, prevail yeah, in the yeah, pandemic yeah. we will prevail yeah, yeah. in the pandemic we will prevail in the pandemic and we thank you God for exceedingly and abundantly above anything we could ever ask or think activate that power within us God that makes it so, for we believe that it is so. Yes. And so it is in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. And amen again. And amen again. And amen again. This is what your assignment is today. On every post, on every tweet, on every Instagram, Facebook page you can find. 
Hashtag shepherds in the field. Shepherds in the field. Whenever you hear somebody complaining about something or worried about something, tell them the shepherds in the field. When they ask you what that means, this is an opportunity for you to tell them what it means for Jesus to be in the field. Tell your children, shepherds in the field. Tell your refrigerator, shepherds in the field. I shall not want. <clears throat> not for food, not for friends, not for understanding, not for compassion, not for human touch. The shepherd is in the field. <laughs> I can rest easy now. He's going to lead me into green pastures. He's going to bring me into still waters. 2021, I'm ready for you. Me and the shepherd going into these green pastures. Going to drink these still waters. Enemies, get your glasses clean so you can watch me eat because he's going to prepare a table before me so you can see it because my shepherd my shepherd is in the field this is the word of the Lord to you today don't let it end today carry it with you this week that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He supplied my salvation. <laughs> he supplied my redemption. <laughs> he supplied my justification. He supplied my sanctification, my glorification. Surely he can supply my lights, my water, my gas, my food, my rent, my health, my strength, my friends, my company. Just knowing you in the field lets me know that the ending of the story will be different because you came in the field. I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, the senior pastor of the Potter's House. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father. Enjoy the shepherd in the field.